okay so yeah so good afternoon um, everyone so we are uh, going to have the da cv raman lecture before i uh, very briefly introduce today's eminent speaker and invite him for the da cv raman lecture let me so some slides about indian physics association which is sponsoring this lecture series uh, i was also requested that uh, this about information about ipa should be spread and uh, with a request that uh, you all can join this uh, association so indian physics association was founded in 1970 currently it has 3500 members spread all over india and abroad the aim and objective is to help the advancement and dissemination and application of knowledge of physics you can find more details in the website or if you have any query you can write to that email address the current executive committee is shown here it is president is uh, director of pifr and vice president is director sn bose center uh ip also gives uh, these awards uh rd billa memorial award uh, also uh, ashwini rath memorial award in nuclear physics uh, rahul basu best physics award in high energy physics and uh, cvk bawa award for in nuclear physics solid state physics and these are given by the indian physics association it also organizes symposia lectures and uh, there are bilateral collaborations one of the lectures is today's lecture i'll come to it at the end there are bi lecture a bilateral exchange of lecturers between institute of physics and indian physics association there is a pa pandya endowment lectures recently there is added uh, in memory of dr hema ramachandran uh and uh, there are many colloquiums young physicist meets joint ipa and american physical society webinars and so on also there was a ipa 50 lectures uh, these were the scientists who delivered uh, these lectures on occasion of ipa turning 50 years then uh, there are some publications physics news is uh, the thing which comes out weekly there are also policy papers uh issued by indian physics association books and monograms some examples are shown here uh ip also has started a gender in physics working group the advisory panel and the group members are shown uh in the slide it was it started in may 2017 uh it has its uh, presence in social media facebook twitter uh you can follow or like this page and then there is a youtube link which has all these lectures of ipa colloquiums ipa young physicists meet which uh, uh, was recently organized by nicer you can find those videos and interactions are there about today's uh, lecture uh, this is a da siviraman lecture series it was initiated in 1989 Uh, with a grant from da initially these lectures were given to undergraduate students in science and professional colleges but within the bombay greater bombay area uh, with the objective of exciting the young minds four da cv raman lectures were selected every year who usually deliver two lectures each, each at different venues and the lecturers were paid a token honorarium of 5000 since 2009 it has been extended to all parts of the country and are delivered by distinguished scientists from nearby institutions you can see some lists i have already shared with you also in email some of the speakers the selection of four da cv raman lecturers per year who deliver the lecture is made by the executive committee of ipa and from 2017 uh it has been uh, made to five speakers out of which at least one will be a woman scientist currently it is supported by board of research in nuclear sciences da and each lecturer is paid a honorarium of 15000 rupees and for organizing uh, some costs are given to the institute organizing it so that is uh, briefly about this uh, 
DAE uh, CV Raman lecture. Now, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, today's speaker. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, uh, Professor Gautam Bhattacharya, Senior Professor and Director at Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, who will be delivering the DAE CV Raman lecture. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya did his uh, BSc, MSc, and PhD from Calcutta University. His uh, PhD thesis was with uh, advisor was Professor Amitabh Rai Choudhury, uh, titled "Testing Physics Beyond Standard Model from Precision Electroweak Measurements." His uh, research interests lies in dynamics of electroweak symmetry breaking, supersymmetry, extra dimensions, composite Higgs neutrino and flavor physics and their interplay with collider uh, with uh, with collider results he has he did his postdoctoral uh, fellowships at cern and also infn fellow at uh, university of pisa uh, because of his uh, academic excellence and excellence in research he has been recognized by several awards starting from a gold medal for topping the msc exam in calcutta university to BM Birla Science Prize, Fellow of Indian National Science Academy, Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, and Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, J.C. Bose National Fellow. He has, he has held visiting positions at several places, uh, including uh, uh, apart from uh, CERN and University of Pisa, in University of Paris, IC ICTP, in G Daisy, Germany, and other places. He has uh, more than 100 research publications. Some of his papers are very, very well cited. Uh, supervised five PhD students to degree and given uh, many prominent national and international level talks and served in several uh, academic scientific committees. So with these words, I would now request Professor uh, Otam Bhattacharya to deliver the DAE's CV Raman lecture. As we are setting up, uh, we will welcome him to the stage with a bouquet of uh, flowers. So I request Swati. Can you hear me? So it's a great honor for me. It's a privilege to be invited uh, to give a lecture in this series. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to the organizers, uh, NICER and IPA. Uh, my thanks to Director of NICER, who is sitting here, is my old friend, and also Professor Bedango Mohanty, whom I know since many years. So I have come here before, but not to this auditorium. This is a new auditorium, it's very impressive. And so I'm very happy to be invited to give a talk in this auditorium. Uh, so I'll talk about. Uh, the historical developments of the 20th century field theory and particle physics to give you the context in which uh, we talk about the so-called God particle 
I mean, it's not a right name, but anyway, so that's how uh, the newspaper published it. Now, it doesn't go. This, this should be the, how do I go to the next slide then? I mean, using this. Okay, fine. Okay. So whatever I wrote here is basically the, you know, how I am guided to talk to you. So instead of seeing what, I mean, you see what I wrote, but I request you to listen to what I say. Uh, Maxwell's electromagnetism, okay, which is a description of light as electromagnetic wave. Then Einstein's special relativity, which is basically the conversion of energy to mass and vice versa equal to mc squared. And quantum mechanics, which talks about the stability, describes the stability of atoms and explains the spectra that worked too well. Okay. Now, Dirac equation solemnized the marriage between Spatial relativity and quantum mechanics, right? In the early 30s, I mean, around, um, my, say, late 20s, early 30s, quantum electrodynamics was created from the union of these three things. That is to describe how light interacts with atoms. But it faced a roadblock in the construction. I'll tell you the story, what, it, what happened. Now, quantum electrodynamics uh, is based on uh, quantum field theory, which tells you that uh, vacuum Normally, what do you know as vacuum? Something which is empty, but vacuum is not empty in quantum, in field theory. It contains an infinite possibilities of electron, positron, or particle, antiparticle pair, you know, transient, ephemeral, I mean, short-lived particles creating and annihilating within themselves. So vacuum is not empty, it's full of such particle and particle pair. And for a very short time, delta T, which is smaller than H cross by delta E, which you must have read in uh, as uncertainty principle, I mean, energy and momentum need not be conserved. So at that time, within that short span of time, the energy of these intermediate virtual particles can go all the way up to infinity, okay? Now, in 1929, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, who was in Zurich, uh, you know the name, Pauli, he got a remarkable postdoc. His name is James Robert Oppenheimer. Now, Oppenheimer became like, you know, later became known as wartime hero, you know, after the Second World War. But he was a very, very bright theoretical physicist who did his PhD with Max Born. Now, after his PhD, he joined Pauli's lab as a research assistant. Pauli told him, you calculate the hydrogen spectrum but not using Dirac equation, using quantum field theory, using QED, quantum electrodynamics. So Oppenheimer calculated it. So his calculation 
had to take into account that um, um, for example, an electron emits a virtual photon and an electron where you, in the vertex, you can see the energy and momentum did not be conserved. And immediately afterwards, they recombine to give you back the electron. A kind of a loop uh, where the intermediate particles can have any amount of energy from zero to infinity. And he has to take all these possibilities. And he has to sum all these possibilities. So normally, if you take the sum, um, if it is a converging series, for example, like one plus half plus one by four plus one, you get two, right? It's a, it's a converging series. He got infinity. Now, but it's not an acceptable thing. I mean, QED was constructed to take into account something what quantum mechanics could not, what Dirac equation could not. So he found this answer. Now, of course, I mean, atomic, the power of atom is very important. You see that if you have a battery, normal battery, it's just, I mean, you know, you know the separation between cathode and anode and you see that you will generate something like 10 to the three volt per meter, okay? Battery did not be a meter, but whatever you generate, it's like 10 to the three approximately volt per meter. You go to an accelerator, it's like 10 to the seven volt per meter, the normal accelerator. But within an atom, which is the size, the distance between the electron and the nucleus is like 10 to the minus 10 meter. And what is the binding energy? This 13.6 electron volt, not like 10 electron volt. So 10 to the 11 volt per meter. 10 to the 11 volt per meter is the. Yes, so it means that, I mean, uh, the separation is like 10 to the 11 volt per meter. So atom has an enormous potential as an energy. So it is very important to study the microscopic dynamics. So it is at that time, I mean, people started feeling about, you know, I mean, uh, having a consistent theory and this theory faced a roadblock. Now, so that was 1929. Now, years later, after the war, in 1947, there was a famous conference near New York. It's called Shelter. It was called Shelter Island Conference. Well, QED was not yet solved at that time. Till that time, the infinity still haunted the, you know, physicist. So in that conference, one student of former student of uh, Oppenheimer. His name is Willis Lamb. He reported a strange thing. Using the technology of microwave radar that he developed during the war, he found a splitting of one part in a million between two lines in the hydrogen spectra, which according to Dirac's theory means Dirac equation should coincide. Okay. So in that conference, there were upcoming stars like Schwinger, Julian Schwinger and Richard Feynman. So Oppenheimer gave a task and there were others of course, that you explain Lamb's result. Now Lamb's result is very important. Now, this is the first experimental proof that vacuum is not empty. What happens that uh, uh, these kinds of, you know, transient particles, particle antiparticle pair, they distort the shape of electromagnetic field. Okay, because electromagnetic field can split into this particle antiparticle pair and then they recombine. So it's 
changes the shape of the field. So the in, which in turn affects the motion of the electron and that leads to the subtle shift in energy which Lamb had measured. But Lamb had measured neither zero nor infinity. He measured a small number which was robust. And the job of the next generation of physicists was to explain that number. The solution came. Solution came from these two gentlemen and another one working independently in Japan. His name is Tomonaga. So Schwinger and Feynman, they used different techniques. I'm not getting into that. So what was important? The imp so there was this infinity. What was important? Important thing was to find a reference number, X which is some kind of an experimental value that you go and measure something. Doesn't matter how you calculated it, but something which I know to be correct experimentally. Suppose that is X. So any quantity Y can be calculated relative to X. Okay. So that part is finite. So if you know what is X, for example, if you somehow can measure the charge of the electron experimentally, with respect to that charge, you can calculate the magnetism of the electron. Because if you try to theoretically calculate the charge, quantum field theory, I mean, quantum electrodynamics will give you some infinity. You try to calculate the magnetism, you get infinity. But these infinities are related. So if you express one, if you replace one infinity by an experimentally observed quantity, which I called X, then as a function of X, you can calculate Y without any ambiguity. So electrons charge, electrons mass, and the Lamb shift, both, all of them, all three, independently would yield infinity if you calculate from QED. But if you replace, but once you replace electron mass and electric charge in the expression of Lamb shift, you get huge numbers cancel against huge numbers. And you get a sensible, small num finite small number, which Lamb has found. This technique of calculating something in terms of some known reference points is called renormalization. Okay. Now, think of, I mean, this is a term which you will encounter in the next few years. Okay. But this is as simple as that. Well, you will see that it is not as simple as I am telling you today, but uh, this is what it is. Now think of an charge of the electron, right? It's a point particle. And you try to imagine that you are seeing it on a computer screen. You, there are pixels. Now the electric charge is confined in the innermost part, right? And there are clouds of electromagnetic fields surrounding it. Then you increase the resolution of your instrument, like your microscope, you will see that again, the charge is confined in the innermost layer and you can continue and you will see the charge will be confined more and more into the innermost pixel. So the density in that pixel density of charge is increasing. The more and more you see, because one pixel is split into many other pixels, but charge is always confined at the center. Agreed? So the density of the charge within that small, increasingly small region forever, as you increase the resolution of your microscope will increase. The rate at which this density changes with the change in your microscope's resolution power is called beta function, okay? 
Now that is how you are going to calculate the impact of renormalization from one scale to another scale in okay scale of resolution okay because in for example large hadron collider you you have a considered as a microscope you can see you can go up to a certain small distance if in future you build even more powerful accelerator you can probe even smaller distance but some quantities change according to certain theoretical interpolation and that is controlled by the beta function okay so for quantum electrodynamics this beta function is positive which means that you will see increasingly dense you know charge distribution inside the innermost pixel and that will continue forever so that is how the infinity problem was solved now what is quantum electrodynamics it's a gauge theory now what does it mean I, I, let me let me tell you slowly okay gauge means the word gauge means phase which means that the theory yields the same physical quantity observable even if you change the phase of for example the electron at each point in space and in each instant in time different at different points in space and time because it is not the same phase at all points and an all time it's called a local theory okay or a gauge theory i give you an analogy for example what is a global theory uh, think of dirac equation where if you change the phase of um, the electron wave function for example by a constant amount nothing happens okay the equation remains the same but if you change the phase which is different at different points in space and different instant in time equation does not remain the same it is not very difficult to you know understand it think of a circle okay now if you change the rotate the circle so the rotation angle is the same everywhere at each point so you get back the same circle but suppose the rotation angle is different at different points then it does not remain a circle you distort the shape of the circle right agreed so you need some other thing some other element to keep it same so for local symmetry if you need invariance you need one more element and that element is a gauge field and the theory is called a gauge theory it's like an elastic fabric that stretches everywhere by an amount by the um, an amount which exactly cancels the effect of changing the angle at different points in space and it's like a compensating uh, you know object the rotation have to be compensated so one rotation which is distorting the shape is compensated by a distortion in some other thing okay so you understand so so electron wave function is changed at different points in space and time uh, immediately requires the existence of one other element which is the gauge field which is the photon which means that gauge invariance necessitates the existence of the force carrier which is the electromagnetic force in other words if you demand gauge invariance of nature the existence of photon is automatic it is inescapable so quantum electrodynamics is such a theory where you have both an electron and a photon and they are balanced in a particular way 
and that immediately gives you the strength at, in by which a photon can see the electron you understand so there is an automatic consequence and the invariance means that no matter what is what your calculational scheme is you know accountancy scheme is at the end of the day you get the same result and the invariance immediately requires that photon has to be strictly massless so the masslessness of the photon in fact the existence of the photon and the masslessness the existence of the force carrier and its masslessness is an automatic cons consequence of your demand that nature has a gauge symmetry <clears throat> now instead of one particle you can think of two particles like neutron and proton and think of uh, you know an equation which instead of electron deals with a doublet like a pair of particles which is neutron and proton now strong interaction does not differentiate between neutron and proton only electromagnetic interaction does because one is electrically charged the other is not so electromagnetic interaction is weak so for example ignore the electromagnetic interaction so there is no difference between neutron and proton so in your theory if you replace all the neutrons by protons or vice versa nothing happens right so in quantum mechanics uh, there is no concept of a pure state i mean this i mean it's always a hybrid state in one extreme it is pure in one sense in the other extreme it is pure in a different sense it is like you know if you have this radio you change the knob from minimum to maximum somewhere in between you have a mixture so it's like that i mean somewhere in between it's a combination of neutron and proton okay suppose you want to change from one state to another in the case of electron i mean only electron in quantum electrodynamics only or if you just take one electrically charged particle dealing with a photon you deal with a number but here you are taking a pair of particles you deal with matrix okay the moment you deal with matrix what you will get you have a gauge theory so you will have a gauge boson which is a spin one carrier which will change a neutron to a proton now since neutron is electrically neutral and proton is electrically charged clearly that the carrier of that interaction will be electrically charged right now when you deal with such matrices in a in a and you construct the theory uh, with a, with more than one particle with two particles for example the theory is called young mills theory by the name of two scientists cn young and robert mills so this young mills theory at that time again faced a roadblock that um, what about this particle which is electrically charged gauge particle yet massless because you need to have gauge invariance i mean otherwise why you are constructing the theory if you don't have gauge invariance what will happen your renormalizability will be lost okay fine i don't care about renormalizability you will get back the infinities in your theory you understand so you have a problem now with an electrically charged carrier of um, of a of the weak uh, of 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 a force which is like electromagnetic force but electromagnetic force is you know carrier is electrically neutral but here it has to be electrically charged in the meantime something else was happening something else was happening uh, in some other front people realized there is another force which is responsible for for the daylight for the burning of the solar fuel now inside sun's core 
four protons, okay, the hydrogen nucleus, are clumped together as a tight object by strong interaction. And then weak interaction converts them to helium. Okay. And energy is liberated in the form of photon. Now, these photons bounce back and forth inside sun's inner layers for several hundred thousand years. And then they reach the surface. And then eight minutes later, they are here as daylight. So side by side, people realized that uh, the same force, which is responsible, which I called weak force, responsible for conversion of four proton, you know, clumps into helium is also responsible. I mean, it is related for what, uh, you know, you have seen in laboratory, beta decay. Okay, these are same things, basically. Actually, I mean, let me tell you, I mean, I once heard a, um, I think in, uh, uh, in one of the CERN theory picnics, uh, uh, there was a very famous uh, physicist who was in the experimental group who used to join us and tell interesting stories. His name is Jack Steinberger. He expired during this COVID period at the age of 99 or close to 100. He was a student of Fermi in Chicago. Uh, he used to tell different stories, anecdotes of, of the old time and people used to curiously listen to what he was telling us. So, um, so he told us that at that time, you see that there are so many new things for some, there were experimental evidence. For some, there were not. Like, for example, general theory of relativity. I mean, there was no experiment yet. You know, Einstein, uh, Einstein didn't get Nobel Prize for that. You know that. There are so many things. Which, but, and uh, the best students are all going to do, you know, physics for something. What was the most interesting thing that people thought, you know, that time to be existing that requires immediate attention? Now, many people were saying many different things, you know, some uh, uh, like general theory of relativity or many other things. He said, no, I mean, in those days, you know, I mean, people were, um, uh, you know, the physicists were like, you know, they were very down to earth. I mean, they used to take experiments very seriously. So, so the fact that electron is coming from the nucleus, electron is supposed to be on the outer shell. The fact that electron was coming from the nucleus was the, was the biggest story at that time. That's beta decay. There was no explanation. Of course, then Fermi's theory came. And as early as in 1941 or 42, Julian Schwinger conjectured that this beta decay, which is, you know, is, is, is probably a weak interaction theory and is mediated by the force carrier, which is a massive object, a gauge field, a massive object, and electrically charged. Of course, I mean, from the charge balance, you can figure out it has to be electrically charged. A neutron goes to a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. So the fact that neutron is being converted to a proton means that it is electrically charged. And it has to be massive because the range of interaction is very small within the nucleus. So something that you will find from Young Mills theory when you deal with matrices. But again, I mean, this is again a roadblock. How do you get a, suppose you say that it's a gauge force, okay? But then what about gauge invariance? It's massive. So infinities will haunt you again. Right? So, so many, you know, puzzles were coming from many different directions. So, this how to uh, reconcile this gauge invariance with massive gauge boson. Now, before that, uh, one of the Indian uh, 
physicist. His name is George Sudarshan and his PhD supervisor, Marshak. They came up experimental uh, based on experimental observations with a theory that this weak interaction has uh, a B minus A nature, vector minus axial vector type of interaction with the fermions. What does it mean? Um, uh, you know that, uh, for example, take the electromagnetic field. The electric field and magnetic field have both magnitude and direction. So they are vectors, right? So electromagnetic force, like uh, carriers, the carrier of electromagnetic force is photon has a spin uh, one in, in, in the unit of Planck quanta, which is a characteristic of a vector particle. Now, a vector is something which flips direction when you see in mirror. An axial vector does not flip uh, its direction, okay? Now, electromagnetic interaction is purely vectorial in nature. When it talks to, when the photon talks to an electron and a positron, it is purely vectorial. Whereas weak interaction, there are a lot of, you know, competing theories, like whether it is scalar, tensor, you know, I mean, finally it is V minus A. So conjecture, I mean, you know, proposed by um, Sudarshan Marsak and more or less at the same time, Feynman and Margelman. And experimentally uh, proved by Madame Wu, CSU, from Cobalt 60 experiment. Now, the fact that electromagnetic interaction has the nat V nature, means vector nature, and weak interaction has V minus A, means there is, at least the V part is common. So, so are they the two manifestations of some common interaction? So, some people started dreaming about that, that whether electromagnetism and weak interaction have a common origin. So this is how things were sort of developing at that time. And, but this was an important thing, how to reconcile gauge invariance with the massive gauge boson, which is now required to explain beta decay with uh, gauge invariance. I mean, some problem solved, you know, I mean, now it is coming back. So there are two problems now, okay? I mean, the problem got solved, now it is coming back in a different form, okay. Now I will do a slight detour. You will think that why I'm suddenly talking about it and immediately it will be clear to you why I'm talking about it. Now, uh, when I'm talking about symmetry, well, what does symmetry mean? That if you, you know, do something, nothing happens, right? And you say that uh, there is a symmetry of the system. Now think of this, uh, sorry. Yeah, dinner table, where suppose you sit here or here between the two plates and you have five or six of you, you are five or six, you know, sitting, each of you sitting in between the two plates. Now you have a choice, suppose one of you, you have a choice. You can take the plate on your right or in your left, right? You have a symmetry. This is a symmetric situation. You can take the one on the left or the right. But the moment you choose the one on the right, everybody else will have to choose the one on the right. Right. So it's kind of a discrete symmetry, two possibilities. And the moment you choose one, everybody else will have to follow suit. Now think of this symmetry. Water molecules, you know, in, in normal temperature. This, Water molecules uh, have a pure rotational symmetry. I mean, they can go 360 degree this way, this way, or that way in any direction, a pure rotational symmetry. But in a sub-zero temperature, when they are, when they are frozen, uh, they can take different shapes. For example, in this shape, the snowflake, you will see that if you rotate it by a multiple of 60 degree, it looks the same. So it has a six fold discrete symmetry, which is a lesser symmetry than the full rotational symmetry you had when you were above zero degree. Now the, 
why I'm calling it a hidden symmetry? That if your experience is confined to you know sub-zero temperature, you will not realize the full symmetry that the original ancestor, you know, the originally the molecules uh, of the molecules of water had the full rotational symmetry. You will not be able to realize that because the experience is limited to sub-zero temperature. The 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 dynamics is not apparent to you. And it is spontaneously broken in the sense that it is an enigmatic change. I mean, it does, it could have been instead of six fold, it could have been three fold. Okay. It's a change from solid phase full symmetry to liquid phase, sorry, liquid phase full symmetry to solid phase lesser symmetry. Okay, now I come to a more relevant example, which is superconductivity. Superconductivity was, what is the time now? When did I start? 4.30. Okay, okay, 4.30, okay. Oh, what is superconductivity? Superconductivity was discovered in 1911, Kamerling Jones. Okay, that, um, but um, that at minus 269 degree, there is no resistance. Okay, but in real terms, what happens? That when an electron goes through a lattice of uh, crystalline at ionized atoms. So the negative charge is attracted by the positive charge on the crystal. So there is a distortion in the lattice. So when the second electron comes, it faces a distorted lattice. What can happen is that the two electrons because of the situation, because of this, when, you know, I mean, because of this cooperative collective behavior can act, can be attracted towards each other through magnetic interaction. Let me give you an example. I mean, suppose I don't like you, God forbid it never happens. But I like your director and you like your director. Both of us are going towards him. So if he does not see the director, he will think that you and me like each other. So even though electrically they repel, magnetically their spins are so aligned that the spin of one electron can cancel the spin of the other electron so that the two object in a cooperative manner, in a collective manner, looks like one object, which is a collection of two electrons, uh, which has spin zero, for example, or integer spin. These pairs are called Cooper pairs. Okay. And And this is actually responsible for what happens next. Means zero resistance. Magnetic fields are repelled from superconductor. That is the reason that uh, some of these, you know, companies are trying to build fast railway tracks, no? Because superconductors repel uh, magnetic fields. Now, why I'm talking in the context of a symmetry? Now, this is an example of spontaneous breaking. What is the symmetry I'm talking about? It's a two dimensional symmetry. That, okay, now this discussion you may not, you will not find in the paper of those who, you know, paper of the three people who got Nobel Prize, this BCS, Burding, Cooper, Schiffer, because they were, they explained the, uh, 
you know, the behavior of, of the formation, I mean, how the Cooper pair, I mean, was formed and the electronics, not the electronics, the, uh, the field theoretic uh, aspects of it, but, uh, or the quantum aspects of it, but uh, the symmetry aspects of it were not, you know, their concern. The particle, it was the concern of the particle physicists like Weinberg, like, uh, like um, uh, Nambu. Now they looked at it in a different way that there is a symmetry and that gets spontaneously broken. Now, what is the symmetry? It's a symmetry of uh, two dimensional rotation. Uh, they act, that symmetry acts on a two dimensional vector and the two components are the real and imaginary parts of the electron field that destroys the electron. You understand the quantum mechanical operator that destroys the electron. Spontaneous symmetry breaking in a superconductor in, a, in that kind of temperature leaves unbroken a rotation by 180 degree, which means that if you change the field E to minus E, nothing happens, nothing changes. So this rotation angle is different in different points in the superconductor. So what is left unbroken is a rotation by 180 degree, which amounts to E becoming minus E, the electron field becoming minus E. So the product of an even number of such fields may get an expectation value, non-zero, non-zero number. For example, e, the two E, I mean, E becoming minus E will leave a product of two such electron fields unchanged, right? So this is the important thing. The Cooper pair is formed. So what is important here? The, um, the symmetry, the, and the unbroken, the unbroken and the leftover unbroken symmetry. This is the important thing. Now, what happens? Magnetic field is expelled. Electric field is expelled. So on the surface of the superconductor, the electromagnetic field resides with a little bit penetration, which means that it will appear it has a short range. It, because normally electromagnetic interaction penetrates everywhere. But on the superconductor surface, it is confined. So it will appear to you that it's a short range interaction. And short range interaction is associated with the mass of the carrier, which means photon will appear massive in a superconductor. So what is hidden is the electromagnetic gauge invariance inside a superconductor. And photon is appearing massive. So you see that we are, you know, so Anderson started, you know, getting some, you know, throwing some hint that uh, uh, the symmetry is broken and uh, a photon is massive. Okay. Now, Mr. Nambu, a Japanese physicist, had a, I mean, he, he had, he was always, you know, I mean, imagining new things, so always bubbling with new ideas. He thought, what about if the universe is a superconductor? Okay. And, you know, I mean, then you have the Cooper pairs. And when the two electrons are released from the Cooper pair, they have more energy because the binding energy is now going to the individual electrons. Energy is mass, so it is appearing massive. So as if, for example, the neutrons and protons were massless to start with, and they acquire mass through spontaneous breaking of what he proposed as chiral symmetry. Chiral, the word, it's a Greek word, which, is mean, which means handedness. So this is how he was, you know, he started thinking about it. And then uh, Mr. Goldstone, I didn't write the name here. Uh, he gave a theorem that whenever there is a spontaneous breaking of a global symmetry, massless spin zero bosons ought to appear. Now, this is a problem. I mean, you are talking about the spontaneous breaking 
I mean, then you cannot escape the existence of massless uh, spin zero object. But these things is catastrophic. The nature does not permit it. Okay, so you have a problem. But is it a solution? Now, you know, last year when Delta swept all across, so we had a problem and people thought in the beginning of this year, Omicron is coming. It's a bigger problem with more hoops. But some people conjectured that maybe the second problem is a, is a solution. So people started thinking, I'm giving an analogy that uh, whether the massive gauge boson, which was a problem, and the existence of a massless spin zero boson. One is a massive spin one boson. The other is a massless spin zero bosons. Both are, you know, if you take, you know, uh, if you take a look at them independently, both of them are a problem. But can the two problems uh, be combined to find a solution? So that is what people started thinking about it. Now, for example, I mean, I don't want, I don't have the time to explain in details, but uh, I mean, if in this case, I mean, those of you who have, not many of you have seen this kind of a potential. I mean, if this ball rolls around this circle, it does not cost any energy. If it does not cost any energy, this direction corresponds to a massless mode. Whereas if you take, if you stretch it radially outward, it will correspond to a massive mode, okay? For example, I mean, if you, I mean, this is the only mathematical equation, I'm sorry for that. I have, if you have a scalar field, if you write it this way, that those uh, states which are in the exponential correspond to rotations along these massless modes. And the number of such modes, according to Goldstone theorem, is the number of uh, what is called a broken generator. I, I'm telling you what does it mean that you have a ground state, the minimum energy state, and generators you know, are required to, uh, to, for transformation. No? They, they, but the, the unbroken generators will kill the vacuum, which means the vacuum will not see anything if you do an operation. But the broken generators are those, when you go from a full symmetry to a lesser symmetry, those generators which are broken, broken in the sense, they will not kill the vacuum, means vacuum can feel those uh, generators, okay? Vacuum is shifted, okay? So, which, which means that uh, those generators which are broken, each of those directions will correspond to a massless uh, mode. That is the theorem of Goldstone, the number of such massless modes. And the radial direction is this, which I said that if you sort of stretch the, radius of the circle, and that is the other boson. And this is the boson that is the holy grail that people, you know, try to look for it. So, so everybody started thinking about how to make the two ends meet, like, you know, massless boson, spin zero, and a massive gauge boson, how to reconcile the two things. What did Anderson say? That, uh, there is some kind of a cannibalism that uh, in the superconductor, photon appears massive, but uh, there is a spontaneous breaking and so massless modes ought to appear and so these modes are not there, you don't see it. Maybe it disappeared and there is some kind of an equation that will take care. He did not show you know, the mathematical details, he conjectured it. Okay, so that's how photon became massive. But particle physicists, you know, gave two hoops. I mean, they didn't care what Anderson said. Why? Because this is a non-relativistic non uh, regime, what Anderson is talking about. Like superconductor as a frame, no? You are, you are, in particle physics, we talk about relativistic domain where there is no such frame. So they did not pay much attention to what Anderson said. So these two gentlemen, Klein and Ben Lee, they said that Goldstone theorem Goldstone theorem means that the existence of massless boson, it should not be there because we have not seen it. It is catastrophic. 
it fails in non relativistic theories but they stressed that this argument holds also for relativistic domain and then mr gilbert now gilbert has a history gilbert went to imperial college to do phd with salam but salam at that time was you know i mean very busy about you know negotiating with the italian government for ictp so um, he worked he registered with kramer and worked independently gilbert wrote a paper which is his last paper in particle physics i am going to tell you what he did next he countered the argument of klein and lee he said that the goldstone's boson's presence cannot be avoided in relativistic theories if you have relativistic theories then this massless boson which is a killer has to be there then you are gone okay so it's like a no go theorem now people became very upset i mean what to do with that now gilbert was also very upset so after his phd he went to harvard he met watson on the same corridor he became interested in in dna and he worked in in uh, you know bioscience and he in 19 i forgot probably 1980 he got nobel prize but this was his last paper in particle physics as a postdoc okay uh, which was a no go theorem so from particle physics he was disgusted he moved to life science got a nobel prize and he also you know did some fundamental work in human genome project at the same time another gentleman who was working mostly with biophysicists bioscientists i mean if you look at his pedigree i mean look at his supervisor 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 you can take the you know look at the ancestral uh, history all the way up to 17th century mostly they are ophthalmologists you know i mean slowly coming down to modern day bioscientists this man is peter hicks so he was he was getting increasingly interested in particle physics the other way around so he said it is possible to bypass Bra uh, gilbert's argument if this relativistic theory contains uh photon for example if it is a gauge theory then uh it is possible to arrange for a cannibalism that the photon massless photon if it travels this way polarization is in the perpendicular plane right two transverse directions so it eats uh that massless boson to find a longitudinal component and it becomes massive okay so that is what higgs proposed i'll come to that but in the meantime mr braut and englert joshua englert and braut braut is an american guy they were both you know they both had condensed matter background so they were inspired by anderson's work but they knew that of course anderson's theory is not acceptable because it's a non relativistic theory so they focused on the spin waves and eventually they wrote a particle physics well i mean not a part they wrote a paper which you will understand you don't have to go through the spin waves but their understanding came from the spin waves that if you have if you put a, draw a line i mean put the electrons here each electron has a is a magnet it has a spin okay and they and suppose each electron interacts with the nearest neighbor then you will find that the tip points to in a direction and if you draw the tips it looks like a wave okay now if you imagine that the interaction is not in nearest neighbor but this electron interacts with this guy that guy and the nth guy then you will see that this wave you know this is disrupted the wave is actually the goldstone mode and when it becomes a long range interaction the way the goldstone mode disappears that is precisely what uh, the previous guys have found the electromagnetic uh, force is a long range force and in the presence of electromagnetic interaction Gil, you know that was the you know how, that was how gilbert's argument was bypassed if you have electromagnetic interaction the goldstone boson disappears so braut and englert you know wrote a paper 
which uh, they were inspired by Anderson and they elevated Anderson's uh, assertion from consumer perspective. And they, uh, their construction required a massive scalar boson. Okay. Uh, so they had also the you know sigma particle, which I talked about, but they did not pay their attention there. Their attention was on this cannibalism, how photon uh, gets the mass by eating that Goldstone boson. These three guys, Guralnik, he was a student of Gilbert, Hagen and Tom Kibble in Imperial College. They also wrote a classic paper that the Goldstone boson need not be present in locally conserved theories, means where uh, in the presence of uh, electromagnetism uh, and the force carrier, if it is, uh, if it involves matrices more than one particle, then like the charged W particle in beta decay, they could become massive by eating up those massless bosons. But they also concentrated on how W on this charged particle like W becomes massive. They did not concentrate on how that sigma, the radial excitation, what would happen, what is the consequence? Now, Peter Higgs wrote exactly the same paper, similar paper. He bypassed, I mean, he sort of countered, he obliterated the no-go theorem of Gilbert. But when he sent his paper, he wrote two papers, but one paper was rejected by the reference. And then he sent it to another journal. Uh, he first he sent it to uh, sent it to physics letters uh, because he was visiting CERN at that time and uh, everybody was uh, physics letters editor happened to be the always CERN head of theory division Brent key at that time it was rejected he sent it to PRL now the referee said now people suspect this referee is Nambu okay everything is fine but what about the other particle the other boson now nobody cared a dam about a spin zero object, which may have a mass, which was not seen, no consequence, no motivation, nobody cared. But, you know, pushed by referee, he had to write a few lines on the consequence of that particular radial excitation. The sigma I, you know, wrote in the equation. Apart from the mass generation mechanism, which all these guys have written. Okay, that sigma is the Higgs particle that we have recently discovered. Okay, now only Higgs talked about the behavior of the other boson, which is massive. This is a scalar particle, means spin zero object, but that is massive. Everybody else, including Higgs, Higgs himself admitted that all of us were, I mean, it's not that he took some extra credit. It so happens that he, he is the only guy who talked about that radial excitation, but he admitted all of us were, you know, interested about the mass generation mechanism of the uh, of the carriers of the weak interaction forces. Now, I'll tell you why the, how the Nobel Prize got. Uh, you know, I mean, who, I mean, how the uh, I mean, only two persons got Nobel Prize. That I'll come to later. So, Shelley Glasser, he constructed a model with what we today call W plus minus Z. Uh, these are realities today, together with a massless QVD photon. And, but he did not know how to give mass. His theory is not renormalizable. He wrote his paper in 1961 or 62. Then Salam and uh, John Wood, they had independently constructed this so-called SU2 cross E1. I don't want to go into the details, which gives rise to you know, these three massive uh, gauge bosons together with the photon. But they were world experts of renormalization. So they were unable to digest the masses of W and Z. So they were very unhappy that W, Z have to be massive. Okay. Now, Kibble, you remember that I told you Hagen, Guralnik, and Kibble. Kibble incorporated the group theory into the idea of spont spontaneous symmetry breaking that you start with two degrees of polarization of a massless gauge boson and two degrees of, you know, uh, a real compart and an imaginary part. One is the radial excitation. The other is the you know Goldstone mode of a, a complex scalar object. And so it's two plus two four. And this three is basically the total number of degrees of freedom in a photon, which is massive because there is a longitudinal component also. And one leftover field 
which uh, as i told you is the radial excitation which only higgs pointed it out okay but kibble wrote this paper later kibble huggen and goral make then finally weinberg in 1967 put everything together he wrote this paper of su2 cross u1 model and then salam independently promoted this he gave talks everywhere he wrote a proceedings in a swiss swedish academy journal uh, the important thing is that how to make photon massless that is the group theoretic uh, technique how to make photon massless the other three masses and uh, there is the so called higgs boson the radial part of it okay now finally etoft demonstrated the importance of this thing i mean without this higgs field the radial excitation the theory this su2 cross u1 theory the standard model uh, which is the standard theory today in fact would be you know would behave very badly in the high energy limit i have uh, one more slide after this so um, so finally we know i mean you have better teachers here to teach you i mean uh, how this particle was discovered you see peter higgs Eng englert and uh, the CERN director general at that time okay now well i mean it is called uh, it should be the mechanism should be called anderson braut englert guralnik hagen higgs kibble etoft okay but uh, uh, well, I mean, and then it was found from different types of, you know, interactions that, the, for example, that it decays into two photons. It is clear that it is a spin zero object experimentally because a spin one object cannot go to two spin one object. Okay, it's Young's theorem. It's very simple angular momentum conservation algebra. You can find. It. Similarly, what uh, LHC has found. Uh, uh, is remarkable the all the properties of the Higgs boson its strength into fermions that is controlled by what is called Yukawa interaction by the name of Hideki Yukawa who proposed you know this uh, interaction uh, not with this Higgs boson of course in a different context seven or eight uh, decades earlier but unlike the gauge interaction Yukawa interaction is not quantized and so uh this is an important uh, experimental discovery at CERN when people say that apart from Higgs CERN didn't do anything uh LHC didn't uh, do anything beyond I just want to remind that the fact that uh, the discovery of this Yukawa interaction uh that all the properties of the Higgs I mean with the with the fermions have been measured uh with with a reasonably good precision have been discovered there okay my final slide uh so the standard model of Glasso, Weinberg and Salam is now a standard theory. Okay. Now, mass of the Higgs boson is approximately 125 times the mass of the proton with a very small error bar. So it's very well measured quantity. And this is within the range predicted uh, from other considerations. But as I told you, the infinities, no? Infinity still haunt us. You know, I mean, why the uh, so the normalizable theory, of course, but the heaviest particle foreseeable in the theory, you know, you can conceive of, can go all the way up to the grand unification scale, and those particles can take the uh, mass of the Higgs to very high values. But why the Higgs is only hundred times the mass of the proton? So you know, this is this gives rise to a problem, which is called the naturalness problem, and which is the driving force of you know, people who are looking for physics beyond the standard model. For example, there are there is a prescription that there is a symmetry between fermions and bosons that gives rise to what is called supersymmetry. But for each known particle, there is a partner, and those partners have not been found. And uh, there may be some additional dimension. These are, for example, if I if I have a you know like a pencil here. And from a long distance, you will see that it's a line. So this curly dimension, you will not see it. If you come closer, you will see it. Coming to short distance means going up in energy. If you go up in energy, you will see lots of you know, curly dimensions, which you would not see probably today. For example, string theorists, I mean, he's a well-known string theorist. He can tell you how the other curly dimensions may show up someday, okay? I mean, but that require a very high energy accelerator. But you can also think of supersymmetry as some kind of an additional dimension 
with that i will end uh, uh, i'll give you an analogy you can think of supersymmetry as an extra dimensional theory now think of think of uh, uh, minus 1 okay minus 1 what is the square root of minus 1 huh imaginary thing so i think the year was uh, 1570s or 1580s i forgot the name of this italian guy who well there was no italy at that time somewhere someone in uh, probably bologna or florence uh, who found the uh, imaginary thing right the moment you that's an impossible thing normally you think square root of a negative thing is an impossible thing but the moment you take the square root of a negative number you have a real quantity and you, and an imaginary quantity so you see that but what is the square root of 9 3 so you you can express 9 in one axis so 3 is also on the same axis you take square root of minus 1 you need two axes one is the real direction the other is the imaginary direction so this is an analogy where when you try to take the square root of an impossible thing i mean okay is an impossible operation you open up new dimensions you understand one is the real axis the other is the imaginary axis similarly suppose you take the square root of a quantity of a number whose uh, square is zero it's like a fermionic thing okay you put two fermions together it will give you zero okay, two a square suppose it's a a square is zero so normally normally you you take a quantity like three three into four is four into is equal to four into three but suppose it so normally a into b is equal to b into a for normal quantities so we say they commute but suppose a is such a thing that a square is zero okay okay b is such that b square is zero it's some fermionic coordinates you can't see it but try to feel it okay so suppose c is equal to a plus b okay so what is c square if a huh? c is also a same quantity c square is zero so a plus b times a plus b is zero what is a plus b times a plus b a square plus a b plus b a plus b square equal to zero a square is zero b square is zero so a b plus b a is zero so a b is not b a b is minus b a we say the anti comment so supersymmetry is like extra dimension in fermionic co coordinates they're called uh, associated with you will see here this name grassman object this fermionic coordinates not the coordinates you see okay but anyway so this is that the more at the root of construction at the end of the day we have to find those particles which you have not seen so the search is on and whether the higgs is an elementary thing or a composite thing that is another direction people i mean i also i mean spent time in in the all three directions many other people did we could not succeed except writing some papers with something some say it is interesting they are interesting some say they are not okay uh, but at the end of the day the speculation is still on and uh, let us hope that lhc will find uh, some more truth than what they have found so far Thank you very much. It's your hand, we can have some questions. Hello. So at some point you told that uh, because of spontaneous symmetry breaking, there is a uh, mass uh, like massive photon in superconductor, right? So do we observe that photons or they are just theoretical constructions? No, no, no. I mean, uh, you see that, uh, what you see is that the photon does not penetrate beyond a certain point. So the interaction is short range. Okay. And so uh, 
because the electromagnetic fields don't penetrate uh, inside. Okay, so from that consideration, you say that photon may be massive. I mean, it's so the electromagnetic gauge invariance is broken. But you are asking whether there is an experimental test of it. Uh, I don't know. May, I don't know of uh, the details. Thank you, sir. About the uh, Fermion coordinate that you just mentioned. Yes. Like, uh, if uh, let's uh, if you assume uh, there exists some uh, Grassmann kind of uh, dimension that exists, uh, like how will we find some empirical uh, like data to suggest that that can be the? Okay. So what we, what you do is that I mean the automatic consequence of the proliferation of particles. Okay. So, for example, for every fermion, there will be an additional. So the so the space-time symmetry is now extended. So there will be proliferation of new new states. The point is, uh, if supersymmetry is unbroken, then uh, for each known for, for, uh, particle, I mean maybe a fermion, maybe a boson, the partner states will have the same mass, but they should have been found. So. So we have not seen those particles, which, be, which means supersymmetry is not only broken, it is very badly broken. Okay, so even if supersymmetry existed somewhere, the symmetry does not exist in, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the scale where experiment has been carried out, which means that those particles are, are super massive. For example, photon is massless. So it has a partner, which should not have the, it has a, which has to be a fermion, but you have not seen that fermion. That the mass of the Higgs boson is one by two pi beta electron. Can we say that the smallest mass is one by two pi beta electron? Hello. Ah. The mass of Higgs boson you said is one twenty five giga electron. That's right. So, uh, can we say that the smallest mass uh, we measure is one hundred twenty five giga electron? So smallest mass smallest mass of what? I mean, for example, the, uh, there are other particles whose mass is in photon is massless. Uh, mm -hmm. Up quark, down quark, charm quark, their masses are much smaller. Am so I, uh, Higgs, question, you are question. talking, you are asking whether there are other Higgs-like bosons. No, no, what are you asking? My question is like the electron charge we have, the smallest charge is uh, 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19. So is there a small limit to the mass? No, the smallest limit is zero, which is photon. Sir, so when you were talking about that U1 cross SU2. Where are you? Where are you? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, so, ah. uh, were you saying that, is that the like Gauss group of QED? No, no, no. Sorry. I mean, my, that. well, I mean, you see that uh, does not. So QED, uh, QED is a U1 theory. Okay. Abelian. Okay. Abelian, U1. But it is not this U1. So when SU2 cross U1, is a unified description of weak theory and electromagnetic theory. And there is spontaneous symmetry breaking. So how many generators are there? There are uh, three plus one, four generators are there. Okay, these four generators correspond to, uh, or they, are, they, they correspond to four different gauge bosons, right? So the four gauge bosons are W plus minus Z boson and photon. But SU2 cross, but photon has to be massless. So the trick is that you have to arrange the breaking in such a way that from SU2 cross U1, you get a U1, not that U1 I started with, but some other U1, okay, which is unbroken. That will correspond to the photon. In fact, this U1 is a combination of one of the, I mean, the generator in the final U1, which is unbroken, electromagnetic U1, is a combination of the generator of SU2, one of the generators of SU2, and the U1 I started with. From that combination, I found the electromagnetic U1. It's a very smart construction, and the group theory was uh, done very explicitly by Kibble, and uh, because it, Kibble, uh, you know, is, was very good in giving a group theoretic argument too. But the Thank important you. thing is that. Why only Higgs got Nobel Prize and England got Nobel Prize? Why not, you know, all these uh, people? Brout and Englert wrote their paper first. I mean, all in 1964 summer. Okay, so Brout and Englert first. Brout died in 2011. 
but they did not talk about the real excitation. Then Higgs. Higgs talked about the cannibalism, the mass generation mechanism, as well as, as I told you, about that real excitation, the Higgs boson. That is why people used to call it a Higgs boson. And finally, it was Guralnik, Hagen, and Kibbe. They also talked about uh, um, the mass generation mechanism. But they, in their paper, you know, they made it explicitly clear uh, what are the uh, real degrees of freedom and what are the, you know, degrees of freedom that will be, uh, you know, cannibalized, that will be uh, eaten up. I mean, they made it very, very clear. Okay, so when the, so, so there is a rule of three for Nobel Prize. So if Braut were alive, it would have been Braut, Englert and Higgs. Braut is, was not alive. So Englert and Higgs, but the third person has to be chosen from uh, Guralnik, Hagen and Kibbe, equal partnership, you know, you know. And then if Braut would have been alive, I mean, nobody would have come, right? I mean, so, so two persons. There is one more question. Yeah. Yes. Last question. Oh, yes. Yeah. So a person from other has asked some real world application of a person from over there has asked if we can really observe superconducting spontaneous symmetry breaking. No, oh, these experimental details, I don't know. What, what I can tell you that the expelling of the magnetic field was observed as a Meissner effect. Okay. And uh, let me give you a, uh, you are asking about the technical details of the experiment. Yes, sir, I wish to, uh, let me, let me uh, so, you, you have to speak up. I mean, I cannot. Uh, so I have read a uh, news article, uh -huh. which uh, some time ago, which, which said that by uh, by passing photon by passing photons through uh, so speed it's from the speed you can make out actually uh, by no? passing photons through uh, uh, gas of rubidium atoms yes uh, the, the photons came out the other side clumped with each other and they had mass yeah so that okay. was so I, I did not read the details of that experiment that's what I told him. I mean, of course, it is established, but the point is the details of the experiment is medium and all. all. I mean, this this thing I, I I did not read. I mean, yeah. So it it is possible to find those papers. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Bhattacharya for this uh, nice uh, day, CV Raman lecture. Uh, we will end it with a felicitation. I will request uh, Director Professor Panda to come to the stage. Felicitate. I take it out. Thank you very much. There is uh, high tea outside, so please uh, enjoy that.
I have only one.